Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through its tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring at what personal time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in the things that now have been announced to you through those who preached the good news, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. And this is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. I want to cry. <laughs> but I'll save it for later. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're kicking off a new series today uh, in the book and through the book of one Peter. And Lord willing, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be camping out here for the next eight weeks. Uh, and that's going to lead us into uh, the Advent and Christmas uh, season. And even though I want to say that this book is uh, nearly 2,000 years old, it's a treasure trove for our time particularly. Uh, this is an incredibly, I don't feel like I have to come up here and try to make this text relevant for our time. This is an incredibly relevant text for our time. It was written by the Apostle Peter uh, to a group of churches uh, to what is now uh, modern uh, day Turkey. And Peter's purpose for writing was that so these small churches at the edge of the Roman Empire at that time will be able to survive and to thrive in an environment that was actively slandering them and maligning them. And it's very important to understand this, uh, that at this point in history, uh, the Christians here in Asia Minor, in modern-day Turkey, were not being executed. Uh, they, they were not being put to death. Uh, you'll read, we'll read a lot about suffering and trials and persecution. Uh, but at this time, they were not suffering that kind of persecution. It's important to know uh, that there was no state-sanctioned um, persecution at this time. It wasn't illegal to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus. It was just incredibly socially unacceptable. People weren't being killed for their faith, but they were being slandered and maligned. Some were losing their jobs or uh, they weren't getting the promotion. They were losing their livelihoods at times. One Peter is written for a time that is very much like 21st century London or New York or Sydney, uh, where it's more likely that you are overlooked for a promotion, you're gossiped about, or you are excluded from social uh, stratums, all because you follow Jesus. Peter knew that in the face of uh, these Christians being ostracized by the culture, it would have been incredibly tempting for them to doubt the gospel. And, it was, uh, and Peter was committed. He was committed to seeing this not happen. And there are seven distinct issues that Peter will uh, um, um, face throughout the letter that we're going to be talking about. And the, the first one is this. The issues in Peter are uh, physical and psychological pressure, social ostracism and exclusion, the potential pull from their former pagan way of life, a seductive, surrounding, non-Christian worldview, tensions, and inconsistent behavior within the Christian community itself. They were facing spiritual doubts about the reliability of God's promises and the future, and Satan's constant and deadly temptations and trials. Ladies and gentlemen, Sydney, 2023, right? This is no different 
Uh, the, to what we are facing and what we continue to face today, not much has changed. We will still face Satan's attacks. We will still face doubts about God's goodness and his promises. We will still face the tensions of the inconsistencies in the Christian community. We will still face very seductive and non-Christian worldviews, maybe more now than ever. We will still face social ostracism and exclusion. We will face maybe some physical, but absolutely Definitely psychological pressure from our surrounding culture. Not much has changed. And so my hope and our hope through this series is that we would be able to navigate our present culture with both grace and truth. To clarify what the gospel is and what the implications of the gospel are for our own holiness. To help see and believe and live out of our missionary identity as followers of Jesus. To continue to give a healthy theology of suffering. To help us rest Listen, to help us rest on the promises of God, to help us appreciate the reality, and many of us are sleeping to this particularly, but to appreciate the reality and the dangers of spiritual warfare. That's what we're doing. That's what we hope to do. And my ask is this, that we would lean in for these next next eight weeks, whatever it is you have, be here. Be at GC. Follow us uh, uh, if if you cannot be here for any reason uh, to please catch up on the teaching. I I would love for us to walk through this together. But before we jump into today's passage, help me to pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you've given us enough health and enough energy to be here. Uh, We pray for those, Lord, who uh, are maybe are unwell and are unable uh, to be here, but we ask that you would be present in this place, that you would, uh, Lord, shake up the complacency that we may have as followers of Jesus, Uh, that if if there are those who who are far from you, who may not uh, subscribe to being a Christian, who haven't pledged allegiance to Jesus, Lord, would that happen today, not by my work, but by yours? May we uh, sort of move out of the way. May you look beautiful today, Jesus. We ask one thing, that you would make yourself known and felt and seen in this place. Help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful and help me to remember the things that will be. And all these things, Lord, uh, uh, are, are, are under uh, the reality, Lord, that we, we pray that the words of my heart, the meditation, the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart may be pleasing to you. May uh, what we are doing here today rise up to you with sweet smelling incense, we pray. We thank you for all these things. And the church said, and the church said, and the church itself, Karl Barth said, exists to set up in the world a new sign which is radically dissimilar to the world's own manner and which contradicts it in a way that is full of promise. The church exists in the world for the sake of the world, but it exists in such a way that it contradicts the world. And so we live with this tension. We live with this tension of being intelligible to the world and yet mysterious. And so if you're here and you don't follow Jesus, it's okay. It's understandable. You shouldn't feel out of place for not understanding everything we say or do or the values that we hold. That's normal. The church is a sign, and a sign's only work if readers can read and understand the language with which that sign is written in. In the same way that Jesus came into the world, not just as fully God, which we wouldn't have understood, but also as fully human, the church is to be made up of recycled, the recycled material of the world, but in such a way that it is no longer of the world, but still in it and and is expressly exists for it. In other words, our calling as Christians, our calling as a church, is not to become holy hermits in seclusion of the world. We exist for the sake of the world, to be a sign in it, which is full of hope. And so you notice we have to live with this tension that we're going to be in the world and for the world, but not of the world. And if we're going to be the church, listen, if we're going to be the church and not just go to church, which is just the language that we use, where are we going? It's Sunday, where are we? we're going to church. But if we're going to be the church, if we're actually going to be who God is calling us to be in our late modern and increasingly secular age, we need to learn what's required of us. 
Who do we have to be? What do we have to do? What do we have to believe, especially in a culture that is designed against you? We talked about this a couple weeks ago, but we live in a culture that is expressly designed to not have Christ formed in you. You know this. The world is not neutral. It is not encouraged. It's not designed to encourage and strengthen our allegiance to Jesus. Not only is it not designed for it, but it is diametrically opposed to it. How do you stand? How do you believe? How do you walk as a follower of Jesus? How do you have to think about your identity? How do you navigate cultural and political tides without being swallowed up by them? Listen, with all of the overt and covert pressure that we live with in our modern age, how you, you have to ask yourself this question, how Do you end up not bottoming out and shipwrecking your faith? How do we stay faithful and true to the end? And that's the question that Peter will be wrestling with, that we'll be wrestling with over the next eight weeks. That is the question that uh, drove Peter's writing of this text. One of the things that we need to uh, uh, understand as we grow up, as we mature, is that we can't get very far without understanding the idea of paradox, of tension, of the reality that the world is not strictly black and white. We need tension. In fact, uh, if you want to grow your muscles, uh, uh, not that I'm an expert here, but I understand, or so I've heard, uh, that you need to put your muscles under tension. You need tension in your life to grow, and tension is the result of not living in this mushy middle, but taking two seemingly contradictory ideas and holding both of them. Two ideas that may seem like they're going in different directions, but holding both of them together. Now, y'all are way too advanced for this, but when I was a kid, uh, we would take two aluminum cans and we would tie a string to them. Now, if you've you've ever done that, I mean, this is a uh, pre-iPad time, right? This is the Stone Age for some of y'all. But we would tie two aluminum cans together with a string, and what would happen is you'd be able to stretch those cans out. And and the, the whole purpose was to make that string taut so that you'd be able to use them as communication devices, right? It's, it works. It's true. I've done it myself. The point uh, was to get these two cans, pull them apart so that you'd be able to use them as communication devices, and they would only work if there was tension on the string. To introduce as much tension as possible so that you'd be able to communicate with the other person. In the same way, the only way that we, will not, that, that we will be able to not only live, but thrive and to communicate the gospel to a dead and dying world is by embracing tension. I'm going to talk about tension today. There, there are three pairs of tension that this text uh, introduces us today. Uh, the tension of being chosen and rejected. The tension of being rejoicing and grieving. Uh, The tension of glory and suffering. And we need to understand these three pairs of tension if we're going to follow Jesus faithfully and become like him. And I feel like I have to say this here today, that if you are a Christian, and I'm not assuming that everyone in this room is, but if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a disciple, if you are an apprentice to the king, then your whole life is orientated towards pleasing him, towards doing what he's called us to do, towards being his agent in the world. When you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. God takes up residence in you, in your mind, and in your heart, and he replaces old desires with new ones, the things that you used to love, you no longer do because he's replacing these old desires that lead to death with new ones that lead and spring out of life. But that happens as we partner with God in our sanctification. Paul tells us to not be conformed to the ways of the world, but to be transformed. And so if we're going to think and if we're going to believe and we're going to behave as followers of Jesus, if we're going to have our minds transformed, if we're going to offer the world a true and better alternative to what's already there, then we must understand and embrace these three sets of tension. The first being the reality that we are both, listen, we're both simultaneously chosen and rejected. We are chosen rejects. That is who we are. We're the odd bunch. That that is what we are. Come back with me to the text. Uh, 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 Verse 1, 
Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And there's so much that I want to draw out of here, but just one phrase here that we're going to spend most of our time here today speaking of that phrase, elect exiles. That at the very same time, we are both chosen and rejected, and we need to become comfortable We need to settle. We need to make peace with the reality that we are both chosen and rejected. If we're ever, listen, if we're ever going to offer the world something worthwhile, we must embrace the reality that we are chosen and rejected. Chosen by God and rejected for the world. And the question is, is that enough for you? And maybe you think that that's okay because you haven't come to grips with what it really means to be hated by the world because it first hated Jesus. Maybe you've placed your light under a bowl, the world. The systems and values and the patterns of our deeply dysfunctional and deeply sinful and deeply broken world stands diametrically opposed and in utter contradistinction to the kingdom of God. Deeply. And if we are agents of this kingdom, then we have to understand that we will then stand in utter contradiction to the world. There's no friendship between the fallenness of the world and the kingdom of God. One, Paul says, is ruled by the enemy, by Satan, the other by God. And I want you to remember one very important thing, that when I say world, I am not speaking of physicality. I'm not saying that the spirit or the immaterial is of a higher order than the material. That is absolutely what I am not saying. When I say the world, I'm using it as a catch-all phrase for anything and everything that stands opposed to God's good desires for his creation and for the world. And when you're born again, what, 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 what Peter will say later on, when we're born of the Spirit, when we're born from above, when we're born again, when we're regenerated, when the old heart of uh, a stone is taken out and, and it's replaced by a, by a heart of a flesh that wants to and is able to respond to God's loving action, the kingdom of God is there. And when that happens, you move from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light of the sun. And because the kingdom of God continues to infiltrate the kingdom of Satan, you necessarily will not be accepted by the world. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm, so, I'm not really sorry, but you know, I'm sorry to say that we will not be accepted by the world. In fact, your default position now is that of rejection. In the same way that Jesus was rejected, and as we align with the king, the world will now reject us. And this is where we get into all sorts of trouble, because frankly, we care much more about being relevant, about being accepted, about being loved, by being affirmed, by the world than we are about being accepted, loved, and affirmed by the creator. We'd much rather be temporally accepted by our peers, our bosses, our families than be eternally accepted by God. And when we live for the acceptance of the world, we will utterly die from their rejection. It will destroy you. And we will compromise any value. We will compromise any stance. We will compromise any belief in order to be loved and to be accepted by the world. We are sick to the core. When God is small in our lives, but people are big, we get into all sorts of trouble. When the opinion of your colleagues at work matters more to you than God's opinion of you, we compromise our witness. We can offer no scandalous witness to the world when we care much more about what they think than what God thinks of us. And what Peter was eager to ensure was that the folks understood that when they suffer rejection, when they suffer maligning, that when they are objects of bullying and teasing because they follow Jesus, when they are the object of people's passive aggressiveness at work, when you aren't included in some of the after-work activities because you'll have a limit to what you'll drink, or when you are seen as unbearably different because you've stopped doing lines with the boys because you want to pursue a God-honoring sobriety, when you are excluded from the inner circle because you refuse to engage in office gossip, when you are seen as strange and as a prude because you decide to wait for marriage to have sex, when you are not accepted because you think that marriage is a divine institution between one man and one woman, when you're called a bigot because you don't subscribe to transgenderism, when you are seen as a bit of an idiot for giving your money to your local church, when you are talked about as being backwards because you believe in a spaghetti monster in the sky, 
Listen, when your allegiance to Jesus begins to cost you social capital and reputation, when you don't land that promotion because you refuse to subscribe to a 24-7 work culture because you'd rather give yourself to your family or your biblical community, when you're willing to stand up for your faith in opposition, even if that means losing face, that's when our witness will be scandalous. And that's difficult. That's, we need to, that's hard. That's incredibly hard. That's incredibly difficult. Following Jesus can sometimes be social suicide, straight up. For, for, for many of us, it is social suicide. And who knows what's coming at us in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in our Western progressive secular culture. I'm no prophet. I don't know what's around the corner for us. I do know this, though, that we will all be tempted to abandon our faith, every single one of us. You're not excluded. You will be tempted to leave faith, to leave Jesus behind. We will be pressured so that we will be accepted by our culture. We will be pressured to cut corners, to coerce, or to deny Jesus, whether in belief or practice. And this is heavy. This is difficult because it's not easy to lay down an intrinsic desire deep within our bones to be loved. God's put that desire in us. It's not wrong to want to be accepted, by the way. It's not wrong to feel that. That is a God-given desire. The difference is where we find that acceptance. It is not easy to lay down the intrinsic desire deep hidden within our DNA and our psyche to be loved and accepted by those who we can see, smell, and touch. There must be something heavier if we're ever going to withstand that. There's got to be something heavier in our minds and in our hearts to gladly, and you know you can, by the way, because you may be sitting here thinking, oh, maybe not me, but you can. We we can get to a place where we, not only do we accept it gritting our teeth, but where we gladly and we willingly accept the rejection of the world because there's something heavier for us than their acceptance. There must be something heavier in our minds and our hearts that will help us to gladly and willingly lay down our desire to be liked. Yes, we are rejected by the world kind of people, but we're also a chosen by God kind of people. Is that enough for us? And if we're going to withstand the rejection of the world, we need to soak in our being chosen by God. It's the knowledge of our being chosen by God that will help us stand up under the pressure of rejection. This is where Peter goes next. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You have been now, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been chosen by this Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit. God the Father saw you and set his affection on you before time began. This is what foreknowledge means. To know someone in Scripture is, is to intimately love them. It's not just to know something cerebrally, uh, cerebrally about them. It's not just a cognitive understanding or awareness of someone. It is to actually be uh, emotionally involved. And and it's saying that God was emotionally involved with you before the creation of the world. That God, in his foreknowledge, chose you, set his love on you. And that God the Spirit set you apart and renewed you. That's what it means to be sanctified. Sanctified, in it usually when we think about sanctification, we think about growing up in Christ or, or being morally upright. And that has a, a something to do with it. But sanctification in Scripture is simply to be set apart for a purpose, to be sanctified. And, and the Spirit sets you apart for a purpose, to love and obey God the Son. Listen, to talk about obedience for many of us feels like legalism. Peter's very clear the reason why God has chosen us, why the Spirit has sanctified us, so that we would obey the Son lovingly and willingly. 
And Peter begins to explain just what being chosen, what being elect means. To be chosen, to be elect means that we are born again to this living hope through the resurrection of Christ. And he's going to spell this out for us, uh, that we learn about what it means to be born again to an inheritance. Now, I don't know about you. I will not be receiving an inheritance, right? I know some of you have and some of you will, uh, but I do know this. I do know this. That whatever we inherit here on earth will fade. Whatever it is that we inherit on this earth during this time, while we'll still live in the overlap of ages, will rot and will get old. The inheritance we're born again to isn't something that is kept and stored here. It is not something that we we can see and touch right now. It is not something that is subject to decay and to rust. We are rejected by things that are perishable, but we inherit the imperishable. We may be denied the things that are defiled, but we inherit what is undefiled. We're deprived of things that may fade, but we inherit what is unfading. And the problem is that we see the things that are perishable. We can touch them. We can see the things that are defiled. We can see the things that are fading. And when we live in a world that is created to disciple us into believing that the only things that exist, that truly exist, are the things that we can see and touch and taste and smell. So out of sight and out of mind and even out of the realm of possibility. And so in our minds, what is perishable perishable becomes the object of our affections because that is what we can see. That is what brings us comfort. What is defiled becomes the things that we receive our identity from. What is fading becomes the things that we cling to for our hope. And let me just say this, that the opinions and the approval of the world will perish. The acceptance and love from our cultural moment will defile. The joy we get from being in the inner circle, the elite of society will fade. But Peter tells us that there is an inheritance waiting for you. You must hear this for yourself. There is an inheritance waiting for us, being guarded in heaven, an inheritance that is imperishable, that is undefiled, and is unfading. And when this becomes, this, this, this reality, I'm hesitant to call it an idea, but when this reality becomes heavier than the approval of man, when looming larger in your mind and heart is the fact that you are beloved of God, And that he has secured and sealed your eternal future that's being guarded by his own power. When that becomes heavier than the rejection that you will face, then you will be the kind of person that can not only live with rejection, but thrive in it. Water off a duck's back. It may hurt. Water off a duck's back because there's something truer and heavier and deeper than the world's rejection. There, there, there's something with greater gravitational pull in your life than being exiles, and that's being chosen exiles. You're chosen. And so if we're going to be effective agents for the king during our short stint on the field here, one of the first things we need to make peace with is the fact that we are aliens. We are exiles. We are the rejected ones. And we can face that, we can deal with that if and only if our chosenness looms larger in our minds and in our hearts. And so we are chosen and rejected, but we must also make peace with the fact that we must live with both rejoicing and grieving. This is what Peter says in the next verse. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, grammar is very important because we have to, we have to ask, what's this referring to? The, the, the fact that we are grieved by various... We, 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 don't, we don't rejoice in the grief. We don't rejoice for the trials. We're rejoicing in what came before. We rejoice in this, in the fact that our imperishable and undefiled and unfading inheritance is kept under guard for us in heaven. And we rejoice in the very midst of the fact that we are grieved by many trials. We rejoice and we grieve at the very same time. Our joy is often often overshadowed by the grief, but our grief is always, always gives way to the joy. And in this world, it's not long before we feel the full weight of both. But this is the kicker. 
that even in your trials, even in the various trials that you will face, which we, by the way, should be grieved by. Uh, Peter is, is no stoic. We're, we're no stoics here. We should be grieved. Uh, but that grief serves a deeper purpose than what it was originally designed for. Grief is often a sign of being hurt. Later on, we're going to meet this devil who prowls around like a lion in chapter 5, seeking whom he can devour. And he devours as we succumb to the pressure of our trials. But trials, even as they're allowed by God and designed by the enemy to destroy us, listen, this is, this is what I still cannot get my head around, is that what is designed to destroy you actually ends up serving you. This, this is what you need to understand, that as a follower of Jesus, the very same things that were designed to destroy your faith now serve, can serve, strengthening it. Some of our trials will be the natural overflow of living in our fallen world. No one's immune, and yet we're always shocked. Other forms of trials will come as a direct result of following Jesus. But this is the point, and this is the question that suffering will ask of us. Suffering will ask you a question. This is the question suffering is going to ask you. Is it better to suffer, or is it better to sin? That's the question, that as we suffer for the sake of Jesus, this is, this is, this is the question. Is it better to suffer or is it better to sin? Is it better to suffer the mistreatment of your coworkers, the exclusion of your family, the psychological pain of being the butt of jokes on the job site, the potential of losing out on a promotion? Is, is that better or is it better to sin? This is a real question. Would you rather suffer or would you rather sin? Because the reason why so many of us have compromised our witness is because we would rather sin than to suffer for the sake of being publicly and unashamedly uh, uh, aligned to Jesus. Rather than stand for truth, we fall for applause. Rather, at great personal cost, keep your integrity by the way you use your words. You throw away your voice by going along with the flow. So our speech is the same as the world's. Our opinions are the same as the world's. Our preferences and desires for comfort are the same as the world's. And I'm not saying for a moment that you're not in Christ, if that's where you find yourself, I'm saying we need to be concerned. Because what trials will do is they will test whether our faith is genuine or not. This is what Peter says. In this, you rejoice, though now for a while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? So that the genuineness of your faith that's more precious than gold, by the way, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is what Peter is saying, that when we're tested by trials, the way in which we respond will indicate whether we have true faith or not. And it's not that God's in the dark about this. It's not like God's kind of trying to figure it out. He sees your heart. He, he knows but we're often in the dark. And it's when our faith is brought into the light and is tested in the furnace of affliction and of trials of various kinds that we can know in our experience that our love for Jesus far outweighs the world's approval. When we'd rather suffer the malignment of culture than sin against Jesus to avoid it, listen, listen very clearly. When we would rather suffer the, the malignment of culture then sin against Jesus to avoid it, we prove that our faith is genuine and that will only add glory and honor and praise to Jesus because we are, we're proving to the world that Jesus is enough. Remember, Peter's not talking about state-sanctioned persecutions. He's speaking to social marginalization. And the question is, again, would we rather sin to avoid being socially marginalized or would we rather honor Christ and be ostracized by the world? Peter is not a stoic. He's not saying it won't hurt. He's not saying trials don't or shouldn't grieve us. The grief is real, and we should be grieved by being mistreated. We're not masochists, but in the same way that embracing uh, our rejection can only happen when embracing our chosenness by God is heavier for us is the only way that we can embrace the grief of being misunderstood and maligned by our culture because we embrace the joy of our salvation. The joy of our salvation must be stronger and must be deeper and must be louder and must be truer than the grief of rejection. And it's rooted in love. This is what Peter says. Though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. 
Though you, do, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Mm. In his confession, St. Augustine will say, he'll put it this way, he, he'll say, my weight is my love, and by it I'm carried wheresoever I'm carried. You see, what we love is what we will gravitate to. What we love uh, most in our life is, is, is what will carry you. And Peter is saying that even though we haven't seen Jesus as he had, they still love him and they believe in him. And, and so let me, let me, and I need to move on him from here because I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking your time. But if we're going to stand and thrive up under the rejection of the world, we must saturate ourselves in our being chosen by God. And if we're not going to be destroyed by the grief of our trials, we must meditate on Jesus and rejoice in love. And it's this tension now, this final tension of glory and suffering that undergirds it all. Peter will go on to say in verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and, and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of, Christ in, uh, sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. What undergirds it all is our ability to see, our ability to enjoy what the prophets barely saw and what the angels longed to look into, the gospel, the sufferings of Jesus and the glories of Jesus. Two perspectives are on play here. Two perspectives on the life, the death, the burial, resurrection, the ascension of God incarnate. The perspective from below prophesied. It, it tried to look forward and it could only see figures and shadows. The perspective from above looked into but could only see figures and shadows. This is what's amazing. Angels, beings, incredibly powerful beings, that if one were to show up here today, we would all play dead because we couldn't handle the glory. We, we, all, we think we want to, man, the world, and we, we think we want to see God. We don't want to see God. Trust me. Every single time God shows up in Scripture, it's woe is me. I'm playing dead because in case he sees me. If an angel, an incredibly powerful being that's in the presence of God for eternity, always, who's never sinned, never fallen, but worships and serves God Almighty day and night in his presence, not being tainted by sin. They crave to know the gospel. The word there is epithumia in Greek. In other, uh, other instances, this very same word is translated as lust. And lust in our modern context is almost exclusively used for illicit sexual craving. And I wouldn't want to give the impression that these angels uh, have any illicit sexual cravings themselves. But the force of the word there is so much stronger than long. They're craving to look into the gospel. They hanker. You know when you're hankering for a burger? Like you hanker for something? Like, I got a hankering. I don't know if that's American or Aussie. I'm not sure what it is. But you, you hanker for something. They're hankering to even look into the gospel. If you can imagine a closed door with, with, with an old-style uh, sort of uh, key where, where you can kind of see through. That, that's the angels as they're looking into the war room of heaven, figuring, trying to figure out what God is up to. They hanker. But what they hanker for, you freely fully and forever have. Do you, do you get this? Do you get the fact that what incredibly powerful beings, that if they were to show up, you'd be tempted to worship them? You'd be scared out of your socks. Crave for what you fully, freely, and forever have. Do you know how the value of things rise and fall in the eyes of the populace? Hankering, desire, 
demand. How is it that designers can sell a t-shirt for $1,000? Hankering, desire, demand. Why is it that a pair of sneakers that retail for $150 can be sold for $2,000, right? Hankering, desire, demand. Why is there a housing crisis in Sydney today? Hankering, desire, demand, hankering. The value of things rise and they fall in the eyes of the populace based on the hankering that people have for it. The more you want something, the higher the price you're willing to pay for it. You remember Esau in the Old Testament? He sold his birthright for stew, a bowl of stew. He was so hungry, he hankered so much for food that he sold his birthright and the blessing to his deceiving brother Jacob for a bowl of stew. He hankered. And peep this. Angels, majestic, beautiful, incredibly powerful beings that reside in the presence of God hanker for the gospel, and we treat it like a bowl of soup. The gospel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus, yeah, Jesus died for my sin. Yawn. I've heard it. I've heard it since I was a kid. It's boring to us. What a travesty that the things that these angels hanker for, that these things that these prophets we're looking forward to, we treat with contempt. The utter and good news of God in Christ, assuming human flesh to dwell among the people that he loved and has been rejected by. The good news of the sinless life of Christ, where no deceit, no wickedness, purely good, pure light. The good news of Jesus taking upon himself the sin of the world, and dying and incurring the wrath of God through the Roman cross. The good news of Jesus victoriously taking his life back from the grip of death. The good news of Jesus triumphantly ascending to the right hand of God to rule. The good news of the Spirit being sent to indwell disciples of Jesus so that he can continue his work through them. The good news that death will not have the last word. And I'm almost going to have my last word. I'm going to invite the band up, but I'm not done yet. The good news that Satan has been defeated and the ancient serpent has been defanged. The good news that we will forever and fully be freed from the presence of sin because right now we are forever and fully freed from the penalty of sin. The good news that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the good news that justice will one day reign as Jesus puts the government on his own shoulders, the good news that injustice and oppression and war have an expiration date, the good news that the weapons of war will be transformed into weapons that will bring life from the earth, the good news that we are no longer slaves to sin but have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the good news that when the enemy whispers, Sweet condemnations into your ear. You can resist him and he will flee from you. The good news that Jesus will reign and those who endure will be given the right, the honor, the privilege to rule with him for eternity. Yeah, this gospel that angels crave, hanker, lust to look into bores us. So God needs to do something here that I can't. That you, you, you can't manipulate your... I cannot manipulate you. Not, not really. You, you cannot just conjure this up in yourself. The Lord has to do something in our hearts. He has to wake us up. He has to shake us out of our complacency with the gospel. The thing which angels long to look into. And so my prayer is that the, may the Lord do a special work in this place. May the Spirit bring revival in our hearts. We pray for revival all the time, right? Like that's, we, we love that. Yeah, revive the land. Reviving the land will do, like, if I'm a dry stump, we need reviving. I need reviving. You need reviving. May our hearts, like John Wesley's, grow strangely warm this morning. May we offer the world our scandalous, witness. May we embrace our chosenness so that we would be able to withstand our rejection. May we embrace our joy, the joy of our salvation so that we would withstand the grief. 
And may we taste and see and experience with our hearts both the suffering and the subsequent glories of Jesus expressed in the gospel. I'm done. Tell me to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for scripture. We thank you that we are not left to our own ideas. We thank you, Lord, that what the prophets worked so hard to see shadows of, the the thing that angels crave to look into, we fully, freely, and forever have. Jesus, do a work in us this morning. Holy Spirit, if there's anyone here under the sound of my voice that has not pledged allegiance to Jesus, may you change hearts. May you take off scales from eyes. May people be able to see your beauty. Those who may feel complacent in their faith, those who may have compromised their witness, renew us, Lord. Do a special work in this place, we pray. We love you, Jesus, and we pray that you would shine today. We thank you for all these things in your precious name. And the church said, one of the things that we do every single week as we pray is that we, we embody our, our response. Um, and we do that by singing, but we also do that by the Lord's table, by communion. And so if you love Jesus, uh, I invite you uh, to uh, come to the table with us, uh, to enjoy communion with us, to enjoy and remember uh, the broken body, the shed blood of our King, uh, so that we would be free. Bless you.